Anyway, we are uh, going to be in Luke's gospel this morning, chapter 24, and look at uh, one of the accounts given uh, here uh, concerning the resurrection. And so let's uh, stand together, and I'm going to read uh, 12 verses. <clears throat> Luke chapter 24, now on the first day of the week, very early in the morning, they and certain other women with them came to the tomb, bringing the spices which they had prepared. But they found the stone rolled away from the tomb. Then they went in and did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. And it happened, as they were greatly perplexed about this, that behold, two men stood by them in shining garments. Then as they were afraid and bowed their faces to the earth, they said to them, Why do you seek the living among the dead? He is not here, but is risen. Remember how he spoke to you when he was still in Galilee, saying, The Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified and the third day rise again. And they remembered his words. Then they returned from the tomb and told all these things to the eleven and to all the rest. It was Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Mary, the mother of James, and the other women with them who told these things to the apostles. And their words seemed to them like idle tales, and they did not believe them. But Peter arose, ran to the tomb, stooping down. He saw the linen cloths lying by themselves, and he departed marveling to himself at what had happened. Lord Jesus, thank you for your word. Uh, we pray that this morning we would have hearing ears, that, Lord, you would be glorified in our lives, and that, uh, Lord, we would uh, hear from you. I know that uh, each one of us uh, sitting here today, Lord, have uh, a different story, a different life's experience and different trials. But, Lord, we know that just by coming that you'll meet us here. So we just pray that you would do that. Reveal yourself to us, to our hearts. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. You can all be seated. The title of this message is Encountering the Risen Lord. Encountering the Risen Lord. And so in this resurrection account, you can see that the women, they find the tomb empty. And the two men that are there are in shining garments and they're declaring Jesus is alive. Now in the other gospel accounts we know that these two men are angels and just the fact that they're in shining garments you know is one indication but um, you know angels they pop up on the grid in of scripture uh, many times and in different ways and sometimes like the Bible tells us that uh, like in Hebrews, the first chapter, that sometimes you could be entertaining angels unaware. So they look, they look like just like men at times, and you just never even realize that they're angels. And, uh, and here, the angels are going to declare the message and, uh, of the risen Lord, like we see here. These angels remind them also, notice of the words of Jesus that Jesus who foretold of this very thing. And, uh, and so they're reminded at this point of something they have, they heard of the word of the Lord. And then it says that they remembered, hey, Jesus did say that. You would think like, well, duh. They heard it. Matter of fact, Jesus repeated that many times to them and now it's like well that, that's right he did say that and I think about that oftentimes when you may hear the word of God you may read the word of God but it doesn't click it doesn't click until something causes it to click in your life you know that timing when all of a sudden the Lord is saying something to you I, I think of that scripture in Hebrews where it tells us in the, third, the 12th chapter, it says, Therefore, we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight in the sin which so easily ensnares us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. It tells us here, looking 
unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. And then again says, for consider him who endured such hostility from sinners against himself, lest you become weary and discouraged in your soul. So not considering, not looking to Jesus, not, not keeping that front and center, the results of that would cause discouragement in your life. And so, you know, when people come and they remind you uh, of the word of the Lord and what his promises are, you know, that right there is often, uh, you know, encouraging at times. And that's why we're to be around in fellowship and so forth. It's like someone comes and says, hey, God's still on the throne. You go, that's right, he is. It's like, you didn't forget it, but you just weren't thinking about it or you didn't connect the dots at that time. And somebody else who is tracking with the Lord brings the word of the Lord, reminds you of things. And so this is what the angels are doing. They're not telling them something new, but now there's a connection that they're making with this, wait a minute, something's going on here. And so they say that to them. And so they left with that message. They headed off to deliver that message. Now, um, you know, understand the last thing, last scene, the last memory they had of Jesus was one when he was dead. He was dead. So, you know, they didn't have any hope at all. And, you know, it's just like in this life, in this, in this life, uh, if you don't have Jesus, you have no hope beyond this life and oftentimes a hopelessness of dealing with things in this life. But all of a sudden, you know, when you have Jesus, that all changes because, you know, he says what? I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he dies, yet he shall live. And he that lives and believes in me, though he die, he shall live. And so he asked Martha when he had said that, he says, do you believe this? Do you believe that? And so, see, it's hope beyond this life. Because if you have hope only in this life, it's a short lived hope and the older you get when you're young you don't necessarily see it when the older you get and suddenly you start realizing wait this life is really short it's like oh my goodness now I'm like 59 wait a minute I'm gonna be 60 in February those are real numbers by the way <laughs> you know and you're like some of you are looking at like well you're just a kid you know, have you ever heard that I've been hearing that my whole life I still hear it I'm, I'm gonna be 60 you're just a kid <laughs> You know, and, and, I, and I, I come to terms with when will you stop hearing that? When those that are, they get so old that pretty soon they're not around anymore, so they stop saying it to you. There's nobody around old enough to say that to you. So now you're saying it to others. That's the way it works, I think. But see, that, that's what their last thoughts were, his body, just three days previously. It looked like it was shredded, like it had gone through a meat grinder. When they scourged Jesus in that day, they bent him over a post and they had Roman with whips. And it's described really uh, in history as one Roman to the right, one Roman to the left, one Roman behind with that cat of nine tails, bits of uh, le leather straps with, with metal and glass and stone embedded in them and they would take turns and they would hit Jesus from different directions so each had a different effect and it would tear chunks of flesh away from his body and it would even expose literally expose the internal organs by the time they got done scourging him and many would not even survive the scourging they would die Jesus survived the scourging, but when you think about in the minds of, the, of these Romans, like we could go home early if we just could kill this guy rather than have to go all the way up to Mount Calvary and hang him on a cross and then sit there. I mean, you know, and they would just really try and do that kind of damage. That's what they remember. That was just three days previous. And then they hang him on a cross, a Roman cross. He dies within six hours. 
like he had been through a meat grinder. And this is what they were thinking of when all of a sudden these guys in shining garments, why are you looking for the living among the dead? So what are they supposed to do with that? That imagery is in their mind. The brutal death of Jesus three days prior to this account was not the end of the story, as the disciples believe. And the words of Paul Harvey, as he would say, this is the rest of the story. I love his storytelling, you know. Haven't heard him for a while, but this is the rest of the story. And, you know, it's in the rest of the story that distinguishes our faith from all others. You know, um, Paul, he writes in uh, 1 Corinthians, and he's writing of the resurrection, and he's writing of the gospel, and he says at one point in 1 Corinthians 15, 14, and if Christ is not risen, then our preaching is empty, and your faith is also empty. So he's admitting, hey, if there wasn't a resurrection, in other words, if there isn't a resurrection in the message, that's empty. The message is empty. He's saying, even if, if that was our message, it would be empty. And then he says, and if Christ is not risen, your faith is futile. You are still in your sins. In other words, if Jesus didn't raise from the grave, there would be no hope. We'd still be in our sins. There would be no salvation if he didn't defeat the last enemy of death. Paul says, there, you'd still be in your sins. Then also those who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. And it was the end of the road for them if Christ did not rise. And then he says, if in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are, all, we are of all men the most miserable. But now Christ is risen from the dead and has become the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. But the fact is that Christ did rise. And he was the first to rise of what will be after him a great harvest. And we get to be part of that who believe. And so, you know, in three days, Jesus rose from the tomb. And it's interesting because when you look at the various gospels, you uh, can compare the different uh, accounts. And it's really amazing because each one gives a different vantage point of things uh, that they are talking about. And what you have to realize when you compare the different resurrection accounts, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, do this later. Uh, it's, it's, it's fun to do. As a matter of fact, uh, Alan Dreen and I, my wife and I, we were driving home on Friday from California. I've gotten my Bible open and, and I'm comparing all the different accounts and I'm going, oh, do you know that, do you know that Mary Magdalene, when she was with a, a group of women and they were almost at the tomb and then they see the stone pulled away, she didn't even wait to go in. She just hightailed it back to tell the disciples. The rest of them went in. They saw the angel. Mary Magdalene didn't see the angel initially. And then when she tells Peter and John, they rush back to look in the tomb, Mary Magdalene following them, the, the, the group of women, they leave the tomb to go tell the disciples. Peter and John get to the tomb, they look, and then they leave. Mary comes to the tomb, now she's alone, and then Jesus reveals himself to her. She's the first. And so, but when you compare these different accounts and you see the language that's being used, they're not contradicting each other at all. What they're given is snapshots of different times that happen all within about an hour after the resurrection of Jesus Christ. The different groups of women coming from different places, uh, meeting up, some getting there sooner, some leaving, and all this stuff happening. Meanwhile, the angels giving the message different times. It's just, it's fascinating to compare those different accounts. And so, and so although Jesus had predicted his own resurrection no one believed it would happen the disciples noticed there in verse 11 even labeled that talk as as in their words seemed to them like idle tales and because of their unbelief jesus later rebukes them for not believing the testimony 
He says not the testimony of the prophets, but also the testimony that was brought to them by the women. So what is he saying? In other words, he's saying, you know what? You should have believed. Otherwise, he wouldn't rebuke them. They had enough information, and they chose not to believe. And that was a way of thinking that Jesus rebuked. They said to the women, basically, said to the women regarding the gospel, basically, nonsense, hogwash, didn't happen. Can't believe that. That's foolish. Basically, is what was being said. And I love Peter's response there. Because <clears throat> Peter arose and ran. The other gospel tells us the disciple whom Jesus loved beat him to the tomb. That was John writing about himself. He beat Peter there. But I love it. Peter's response. You know, he, he got there. He looked in, departed marveling to him at what had happened. Not believing that Jesus was alive because that was off his radar altogether. He wanted to know what happened. He wasn't believing. Did Jesus... At this point, did Jesus uh, rise from the dead? No, that was not what he was thinking of. Like, what happened? Who took him? Where'd he go? Not he's alive. And then T Peter, being a fisherman by trade, you know, thinks something's fishy about this. You know? <laughs> he was pondering, still not believing, but not like unlike us today. It's possible to see the evidences of God, whether it be by his word, <clears throat> through creation. And you can look at that and you can marvel and yet not believe in God. You could just turn that, spin it any which way you want to believing however you think. Like these marvelous things are here for us to look at. You could even you know, say, oh, it's a higher power, you know, or, you know, some sort of force. Or it's supernatural, but I don't go for this believing in this one God, creator of all things. And so you could see all this and still deny it. But what did Jesus say? And in and, and Paul, really, he says, hey, you'll still remain in your sins. You know, Jesus said in John 8, 24, for if you do not believe that I am he, you will die in your sins. No options. That's it, flat out. And that's heavy. To those who follow Jesus, the resurrection was a complete surprise. Yet this account rocked their world and they would never live the same or never turn back. The disciples became fearless witnesses for the Lord. They were eyewitnesses. And after that, they would experience extreme hardship. They would be beat. They would even die for their testimony. The cowardly disciples became fearless followers of the Lord. And so why this extreme change in, their, in this transformation? What happened? Why would they do this? Because they encountered the risen Lord. That's why. All of a sudden, this life didn't become what it used to be when you've met the risen Lord. And according to early uh, historians, the apostles died for what they believed. Uh, Peter was crucified upside down. Peter, who fled now stood for his faith. He was crucified upside down. Andrew was crucified. James killed by the sword. That's J James, son of Zebedee. John died a natural death, but he had been persecuted and exiled. Philip was crucified. Bartholomew was crucified. Thomas was thrust through with a spear. Matthew was killed by the sword. James, the son of Alphaeus, was crucified. Thaddeus was killed by arrows. Simon the Zealot was crucified. Paul was beheaded. And so here, the fearful, heartbroken disciples became courageous after they encountered the risen Lord. Not until. 
So they could be imprisoned and flogged and killed, but you know what? They would not deny their conviction that on the third day, Jesus rose. And so they had that testimony. And, you know, just looking at this particular account, you know, there even in verse 1 there, it says on the first day of the week, which was Sunday, like today, very early in the morning, meaning the break of day, the women that came brought spices to prepare, what, the body of Jesus. That's why they were coming. Like we would bring flowers to a funeral. They were bringing spices to anoint the body of Jesus. As a matter of fact, Mark's gospel even tells us that they were wondering, what are we going to do? You know, we're coming to anoint the body of Jesus. Who's going to move the stone away? I mean, we can't move the stone away. The stone's huge. But they went in faith. They went forward, not even knowing how that was going to turn out. And, but as it goes without saying that the Gospels tell us the angel moved the stone. God took care of it. And it's so true, like so many things turn out, we'll be fearful of how things are going to turn out, and God does something supernatural, even to move the barriers in front of our own lives to do the supernatural. But the point, the important things is you're doing, you're walking in faith, you're moving forward, then let God do the supernatural. But trust him. Move forward. They experienced that. And, and Jesus, remember, had already risen. Matthew's gospel, there was an earthquake. The angel came down and moved the stone. That stone wasn't moved to let Jesus out. The stone was moved so that the women could look in. That's why the stone was moved. And, uh, you know, God does the same today. He removes those barriers that we could keep, you know, trusting in him. And so it tells us, you know, in Deuteronomy 4.29, you will find him if you seek him with all your heart and with all your soul. You will find him if you genuinely seek him like that. God will remove those barriers. He'll do that work. He'll give you that line of sight if you just move forward in him. And that's a New Testament principle as well. You know, and, and you could read that later in, if you want Acts 17, where Paul deals with that when he's given a sermon on Mars Hill. He deals with that. But in verse 3, it says then they, they went in and did not find the body of Jesus. <laughs> this is an interesting point. For one, inside the tomb, and I had been into the tomb that they say was the tomb that Jesus was in. I mean, nobody knows absolutely for sure, but I'll tell you what, it sure feels like the tomb that Jesus would have been in when you're standing there and you see this whole, and, and where, where it's located and the descriptions of the gospel and everything. I mean, it, it is amazing, but you know, here, you know, three times he told them that this would happen, and still they did not believe, and it says that they were greatly perplexed there in verse four, meaning that they had much doubt, hesitation, and they would have, you know, been, been thinking of all the other scenarios, and, uh, you know, presuming what was true in their mind was impossible to have happened. And meanwhile, that's what they were faced with. They did not find the body, and that's what I wanted to point out. I skipped that, the body, meaning the very physical body of Jesus was not there. Now, that's an interesting point because we are going to receive one day the resurrection body like the one that Jesus had. The very physical components of that body was used. It was gone. The very elements of the DNA, the molecules, was gone. And that's what made up. His physical body made up his glorified body. And, you know, that's why we believe that no matter what happens to this body upon death, or the rapture, that somehow supernaturally God touches 
this physical body and makes it into a glorified body, because he can. How could that be? He's God. He could do whatever he wants. But you just read the account. You say, we're going to have a body like Jesus. And then they're in the tomb, greatly perplexed. And then here's these two men stood in shining garments, almost like poof. Because you see, they weren't there just a moment ago. Or that's what they would have been focusing on. So they weren't there. Suddenly they're there. It's like poof, they're there, these two men. And, uh, and ask them, basically, how come so much gloom at the tomb? And, you know, of course, that's not the exact words, but, you know, <laughs> why are you looking in a tomb for someone who's alive? And people make that mistake. They make that mistake every day, looking for a living God in dead religions of men, among the graveyard of dead belief systems. Instead of reading the Bible, believing what's being said here, like, you know, this is, the, it, it declares this here as the living, living word. Hebrews 4, 12 says, for the word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of the soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. And, you know, here, Jesus is the word incarnate. Read that first chapter of John later. But because Jesus is the word, and he has risen and is alive, then we, you know, uh, take that by faith or we don't. That's our choices, really. And so working through his word. And so, you know, these women are just, you know, being really shocked by all of this. And it says then as they were afraid and bowed their faces, they were startled, but who wouldn't be? I mean, you know, we get startled so easy now, if you're just like walking and somebody jumps out from behind a bush and goes, boo, you could be the most courageous person in the world, but when something goes, boo, your heart speeds up, all, everything, you know, all defense mechanisms kick in, you're ready to fight. When these angels, this an, these men popped up, boom, these angels, they were startled. And so, you know, they were afraid and they bowed their faces quick, you know. Why do you seek the living among the dead? And that's really, again, what separates religions. That there's religions that teach whatever they teach and their Messiah or their, the one that they put their trust in is, is still in the grave. It's only Christianity that has the message of hope because our Messiah has risen. Our Savior is alive. And so <clears throat> he is not here, but is risen. And so those are the words that have thrilled hearts of believers for centuries. And, you know, today as well. You know, believers trusting in that message. And, uh, you know, people who hear about the resurrection for the first time, they may not receive it like the disciples. You know, these, the disciples passed through really four stages of struggle. You know, the first being that when they heard the word, this is just a fairy tale, this can't happen, this isn't true. Impossible for that to happen. And it would be, of course, impossible to believe. Like Peter, you know, when, you, when he checked it out, this is puzzling, and so he was the skeptic. And many people hear the message, they're skeptics, like, really, how could this be? And, you know, that's a common thing among many men. And many, many, among, um, many men have become born again because they researched the evidence and became believers. One being like Josh McDowell, who wrote Evidence Demands a Verdict. It was in his research that he became a believer. So if you seek him, you will find him if you search for him with all of your heart. That's the idea. And so you had that, fairy tales, skepticism. But it wasn't until they encountered Jesus personally that they accepted the fact of the resurrection. It wasn't until they encountered him personally 
Think about that. They were just men and women like us. But Jesus said, more blessed are those who believe, who haven't seen and believe. And that's the faith that is a gift given to men who seek the Lord. And he opens up your eyes to this. And then as they committed their lives to Jesus, then they begin to fully understand the message. But he is risen. There's a new movie out. You've probably heard of it. Um, risen. That's the name of it. Risen. And so I went to see it. Uh, uh, another brother told me he's seen it. And he said, yeah, it was pretty good. It wasn't weird and everything. And I thought, okay, well, I'll go see it. You know, because sometimes you never know. And it was interesting because it didn't really follow like the biblical account because it centered on a uh, centurion who put his faith in Christ eventually through a series of, of things that went down. But it was good because it was nothing really said in the movie that would blaspheme or, you know, really uh, bring shame to the gospel or anything like that. You know, it wasn't anything like that. Um, but just the message that was sent of the resurrection and how it did affect others, because we know it did affect Roman centurions. So although it's not recorded in the Bible, you can see how things like what happened and, you know, portrayed in the movie. And so it was just really good. You know, I do recommend that you see it when you get a chance. But it's just the idea of the possibilities of God who spoke things into existence, like the song that we, uh, worship song that we were singing. Can he not do this? Yes, he can. And then, verse 8, they remembered his words. And so it took that <laughs> to jog their memory. And uh, I love that because, you know, that's how my mind often works, and God's faithful to do that. Things will come back to my memory. Then they returned from the tomb, told all these things to the eleven and to all the rest. And so there was many more than the eleven. We know there was 500 at the ascension of Jesus that were eyewitnesses. But these women were among the faithful followers of Jesus. And suddenly, things clicked. The words of, of Jesus, you know, what Jesus said all came together. Happened just as he said. He was raised from the grave. And so these angels tell them to go tell the disciples. And they obeyed. But when they went and told the disciples, the disciples were bewildered. You know, and the disciples were sitting around, woe's me. You know, the woe's me syndrome. You know, when all, everything's terrible, when really everything's right. And they're sitting around feeling sorry for themselves. Meanwhile, the Lord is risen, but their eyes, they don't believe that. And often that time, that's exactly what happens. You don't believe that, you know, message. Like Paul says, I don't even, I don't want, I want to know not only the power of the resurrection, but the fellowship of his sufferings. But at the time when you're going through the fellowship of his sufferings, you don't forget about the power of the resurrection. He never said that. He wants to know both. He wants to have that heart. And so the Bible tells us, remember this, with God, all things are possible, Jesus said several times. With God, all things are possible. So while they're bewildered and woes me and all that's going on, the scripture says with God, all things are possible. And in that same manner, <clears throat> he can resurrect us from that place of hopelessness as he did the disciples. And so what does it take to be lifted from that place? Believe the promises. You know, once they did that, everything changed once they did that. And, and it does for us as well. And so then it was Mary Magdalene. So these women, Mary Magdalene, she was the one that demons were cast out of. And, you know, all the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, place Mary Magdalene at the cross and at the tomb. And she has an amazing testimony in this, not only before but after, she was the first one to encounter the risen Lord. The first one, privileged to encounter the risen Lord. And it reminds me of a verse where the Bible says, he who is forgiven much loves much. Do you think she was, you know, forgiven much? And because of it, she responded in great love towards the Lord. And so how many believers that 
you know, or how many believe that Mary Magdalene truly was thankful? She was. And you know what? The Lord blessed her, and her testimony reveals that loving devotion. And really, it's no different than any one of us because we're all forgiven of a great debt. We should all respond with that same response. And so, and then to be faithful followers of the Lord. Joanna, she was previously mentioned in this gospel in the eighth chapter. She was a faithful follower. And then, you know, uh, Mary, the same. And then notice it says, other women. And wait, when I was reading this, wait, shouldn't, you know, you think about the, the rule of first mention, shouldn't it be given to men? <laughs> Apparently God don't think, didn't think so. And I love that because this is just another proof that this is not written by men. This is divine. Because if men wrote this, they'd put them in that spot. You know, that's just the nature of man. And so the fact that the message was carried by women gives further credibility to the persuasive force of Luke's account. So no ancient person making up such a story would have women as the first official witnesses. Matter of fact, in Jewish law, women could not do so. I mean, you think there's women liberation in this country a short time ago. I mean, even then, women didn't experience what they did back then. And yet, God makes a statement very clear. And I'll tell you, if men were the inspirers behind the scripture, they would have painted themselves in a better light. They would have somehow figured out a way to hide the sins of the heroes of faith. They certainly wouldn't highlight them. And, you know, today we have similar false messages that go out, whether they be the prosperity teachers, name it, claim it, blab it, grab it, sort of things where if you're not rich, it's because you have no faith, or if you're sick, it means that you have no faith, or it's sin in your life is the reason you are. Well, you know what? I'm glad I don't preach that, because number one, I would probably have to keep you from my house. I'd probably have to rent a car and drive it to church every day rather than the one that I drive. And then the last couple of weeks, I'd had to stay away from you and lie to you because I was sick. You know, but that's all a lie. That's all false. I remember my dad telling me one time that when he was a little, little guy and went to the Catholic church that he was an altar boy. And he would, you know, do his cleaning up after the mass was over and he'd be hanging his robe up on the hook and then he'd sort of look through the back door where the priests were and they were smoking and drinking and playing cards. You know, and that, that sends a message to a little guy who's looking to them and saying, oh, that's what a godly man does, you know, and I just thought about, I, I thought about the misrepresentation of when somebody is elevated and you're looking to the man and then they fail you. So your faith fails? We're never taught to look to men. Always to look to God who will never fail us. And it's interesting because now we're studying through the book of Leviticus. You remember when we got to the sin offering, what's the first thing we saw? The sin offering? It was the priest who had to bring his sacrifice. And then it was the congregation, and then it was the common people. But the priest went first. Blood sacrifice for your sin. So when you learn the word, you find out you don't put anybody on that pedestal. And, you know, so bottom line is, is God makes an incredible statement here and uh, one that just, again, validates the inspiration of the scripture. But many skeptics have tried to write off the resurrection. And as a story made up, a group of zealots, disciples that, you know, uh, conjured up this whole thing. But here the opposite occurred. The disciples were not anxiously looking for any reason 
to believe that Jesus had risen. In fact, they were not anticipating at all the risen Lord. When told of the resurrection, they refused to believe it without concrete evidence. Even a missing body was not enough for them. But in the last verse there, but Peter arose and ran to the tomb. Stooping down, he saw the linen cloths lying by themselves, and he departed, marveling to himself at what had happened. John's gospel says he saw the strips of linen lying there, and Jesus' Jesus's head wrap was folded and set by itself. And so as it was, you know, it looked like Jesus sort of had just passed through those grave cloths. And, you know, it wasn't a quick exit. Everything was taken care of and folded neatly and so forth. So it wasn't a grave robber coming in. It was neatness and, and there was order. And so no wonder Peter went away pondered and perplexed and marveling to himself, asking really what had happened. You know, so this morning, I mean, I don't know where you're at and what you believe or anything like that, but you're going to fall under a category of thinking like, hey, this is a hoax, hoax you know, uh, or, or, or be a skeptic or not, not believe or believe. Fortunately, I mean, if you believe, amen. You know, rejoice. Rejoice in the things of the Lord. But, you know, why is the resurrection of Jesus Christ so important? Because without it, hope would be dead and non-existent. And, um, you know, where would you turn then? Where would you go? But because it is true, we have hope of eternal life. When <laughs> we've encountered the risen Lord. And so this morning we rejoice and uh, thank God for our hope and uh, the message of the Lord's soon return. And you know, if the rapture, the rapture really, when you study the scriptures, the rapture could take place at any time. So some of us may not physically die. We may just be transformed into our glorified body. And so we have that hope as well. But either way, we're going to be with the Lord sooner than not. To be absent from this body is to be present with the Lord, the Bible says. And so although this body might get put in the ground six feet, incinerated, like many others, buried at sea in wartime, evaporated in a nuclear blast, it doesn't matter what happens to this body. God is plenty capable on that day of resurrection to join our spirit who would be with the Lord with the body that's resurrected and glorified. And that's the hope that we have. Amen? Amen. Amen.